The Life and Sad Ending of Jan Howard Jan Howard was born Lula Grace Johnson in West Plains, Missouri, the daughter of Linny and Rolla Johnson. She was the eighth of 11 children. Two of her siblings died before the age of two. Howard's father was a brick mason who received employment assistance from the Works Progress Administration during the Great Depression. In her early childhood, the family moved frequently as her father found work and better housing. They lived in nearby towns such as Kansas City, Birch Tree, and Oklahoma City. When she was eight years old, the family briefly returned to West Plains. After returning, Howard was raped by a family friend. In her 1987 autobiography, she commented on the experience. My body was violated, and my mind was damaged in a way I wasn't to know the full extent of for years to come. In her childhood, she developed an interest in listening to the Grand Ole Opry radio broadcasts with her father. In 2003, she recalled memories of listening with her father. The first time I heard the Opry, I was eight or nine years old. My dad used to tune it out on the radio on Saturday nights, but he only listened enough to hear Texas Ruby. She was his favorite. In 1943, Howard's mother temporarily separated from her father. To help support the family, Howard worked as a dishwasher in a local cafe. Because the cafe owner could not afford to pay her, he gave Howard's family food for weekly meals. At age 16, she took a new job at a drugstore called Model Drugs. In 1945, she married Merle Wood and subsequently dropped out of high school. Wood enrolled in the military soon after their marriage began. Finding military housing for his wife, Wood resettled the couple to Waynesville, Mizzou. In their first home, they shared a house with another military couple. She briefly returned to her parents' house after discovering Wood was engaging in an affair. However, when Wood was restationed to Little Rock, Arkansas, Howard reunited with him in this new location. Howard gave birth to three sons between the late 1940s and early 1950s. The young family continued to move as Wood took on various jobs. Among the cities they lived in were Colorado Springs, Colorado, Pittsburgh, Kansas, and Greeley, Colorado. While in Greeley, the family's house caught on fire. According to Howard, she woke to the smell of smoke in the middle of the night and saved her three children from the fumes. Wood was not present at the time of the incident. Towards the end of their marriage, the family moved back to West Plains. Howard later revealed in 1987 that Wood was physically abusive, especially at the end of their marriage. During one incident, Wood held a butcher knife to Howard's throat, nearly killing her. The same day, Howard and her three sons fled to live with her siblings in Oklahoma. Until midnight, Mommy and Daddy kept us hidden. Then, with as much money as we could spare, we boarded a Greyhound bus for Oklahoma City, Howard wrote. In 1953, she divorced Wood. While living with her brother, Howard became acquainted with his friend, Lowell Smitty Smith. Smith was also an active member of the military. Developing a romantic affection, the two married in 1953. Living with Smith and her three sons on a military base, the family lived a suburban lifestyle. Howard also got a part-time job in the tea room of the Morehouse Fashion Department store. In 1954, she gave birth to a fourth child named Janet Louise Smith. The child had a series of medical problems and died shortly after being born. In her autobiography, Howard recalled the experience. They were closing the top of the incubator. The realization hit me. The baby was dead, Howard wrote. The Smith family then moved to a base in Warrensburg, Missouri, where they rented a newly built home. The couple bought furniture on credit to decorate their home. During this time, she became pregnant again and eventually miscarried the child. Howard worked a series of part-time jobs upon moving to Los Angeles. For a short time, she worked as a cocktail waitress in a strip club. I must have had 30 jobs in the next 30 days, Howard wrote. After several months, she got a job as a secretary. She later recalled that the position was challenging because she could not type or take shorthand. In 1957, she met aspiring country music songwriter Harlan Howard. The pair met through her friend's association with country artist Wynne Stewart. Within a month of meeting, the couple was married. 
on May 10, 1957, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Jan and Stewart's first recording, Yankee Go Home, was released on Challenge Records in 1954. The duo also released a second single entitled Wrong Company. The song received airplay on country radio stations and peaked at number 26 on the Billboard Hot Country and Western Sides charts in 1960. At the same time, Harlan's songwriting career was becoming more successful, with both their careers making airwaves. The Howards often frequented country music clubs in Los Angeles. From interacting with other country artists at clubs, Jan was presented with performance opportunities of her own. The success of Wrong Company prompted Joe Johnson to find Jan a solo release. Johnson chose the song The One You Slip Around With, which was co-written by Harlan Howard and Fuzzy Owen. On the record, Jan also sang the third part harmony. Released in late 1959, the song became a major hit in February 1960, reaching number 13 on the Billboard Country Side Charts. She recalled hearing the song on the radio for the first time. For once, I was proud of what I heard, but it was as though I was listening to someone else, not me. The song's success helped Howard receive the Most Promising Country Female Award from Billboard and Jukebox Operators. Also in 1960, the Howard family moved to Nashville, where Jan regularly appeared on the Prince Albert segment of the Grand Ole Opry. Howard met several country artists while playing there regularly, notably Patsy Cline. In 1962, Capitol Records brought Jan's recording contract from Challenge. According to Jan, her first Capitol sessions with an unnamed producer were a disaster. Frustrated with the sessions, she called Ken Nelson and asked him to record her. Nelson agreed and sent her to Los Angeles for the next session. At Capitol, it was suggested that she would be marketed as towards pop rather than country, which prompted Nelson to have her record a mix of pop standards and country covers. From the sessions, Howard's debut studio album was released in 1962, Sweet and Sentimental. The album featured covers of various songs, including her husband's He Called Me Baby and Heartaches by the Number. Although at Capitol for several years, Howard only had one charting single with the label, a cover of I Wish I Was a Single Girl. The song reached number 27 on the Billboard Country Sides charts in 1963. By 1964, Jan's singing career was gaining more momentum. Finding herself touring frequently, she hired a housekeeper to take care of domestic needs. Harlan also found a booking agent for her shows. He arranged for Hubert Long to work with his wife. According to Jan, Long booked many dates because the Howards owed the IRS $20,000 in back taxes. At concerts, she was making an estimated $500 to $600 a gig. At the same time, Harlan informed Jan that Owen Bradley of Decca Records was interested in signing her. She signed a recording contract with Bradley in 1964. Her first Decca release was the single What Makes a Man Wander. It reached the top 25 of the Billboard Hot Country Singles Chart in 1965. Bradley and Jan had trouble finding a quality single for her next release. They soon found a song written by Harlan called Evil On Your Mind. Jan and Bradley liked the song and thought it could be a hit. Released as a single in 1966, Evil On Your Mind reached number 5 on the Billboard Country Singles Chart in July. Evil On Your Mind became the biggest solo hit of her career. Since its release, it has been considered Jan's signature song. Its success prompted Decca to issue her second studio album. In September 1966, Jan Howard sings Evil on Your Mind peaked at number 10 on the Billboard Top Country Albums chart. The success of Evil on Your Mind also led to an increased demand for Howard's concert bookings. If I thought I'd been busy before, it was a vacation compared to now, Howard wrote. In 1966, she played a tour alongside other artists that ended at the Hollywood Bowl in California. She also played a show in Detroit, Michigan that attracted roughly 24,000 people. While not touring, Howard was in the recording studio. Her next single release was Bad Seed, which reached number 10 on the Billboard Country Chart in 1966. An album of the same name followed in 1967 that reached number 13 on the Country Albums Chart. Her fourth studio album, entitled This Is Jan Howard Country, was released in October 1967 and reached the top 10 of the Billboard Country Albums list. 
During the mid-1960s, Howard also began touring and recording with Bill Anderson. Both artists were not only on the same label, but also were being booked by Hubert Long. On the road, the pair would sometimes sing together, often performing the song, I Know You're Married, But I Love You Still. Anderson and Howard approached Owen Bradley with the proposal of recording duets. Bradley agreed, and the pairing began with their first single in 1965. In 1967, they had their first major hit with the single, For Loving You. It became Howard's first and only single to reach number one on the Billboard Country Songs chart. The duo's debut album of the same name reached number six on the Country Albums chart in 1968. Now a successful musical collaboration, Howard joined Anderson's Roadshow and also became part of his syndicated television program. The show was mostly filmed in Windsor, Ontario, which meant Howard had to fly there every two weeks for tapings. Working with Anderson provided Howard with a steady source of income. In 1968, Harlan and Jan filed for divorce, and according to Jan, the income helped her get her feet wet. In July 1969, Howard's self-titled seventh studio album was released and reached number 25 on the Billboard Country Album Survey. In 1970, Howard released an album of patriotic music entitled For God and Country. It was partially inspired by a poem her son, Carter, had written called I Am. Put to music, the poem was featured on her album. Howard also decided to dedicate the album to Jimmy. It was the most difficult album I'd ever recorded, yet one that would always be the closest to my heart, Howard wrote in 1987. Despite personal difficulties, Howard continued working as part of the Bill Anderson Show. In March 1970, the duet released their second album entitled If It's All the Same to You, and its title track became a major hit. They continued recording and touring together through 1973. Their further singles reached the top 10 on the Billboard Country chart. Someday We'll Be Together and Dissatisfied. By 1973, Howard's latest singles were reaching minor chart positions on the Billboard Country survey. According to Howard, she approached Owen Bradley about the idea of working with a new producer at DECA. Bradley declined the proposition, and Howard ultimately left the label in 1974. The psychological trauma of Howard's childhood affected her as she entered her adult years. After giving birth to her third child, she would cry uncontrollably. There were many times my heart would pound so hard I thought it would pop out of my chest, Howard commented. Howard's sister took her to see a doctor, who explained that she was having a nervous breakdown. To calm her anxieties, he prescribed Howard a strong pharmaceutical drug that she would take four times per day. In the early 1960s, she was rushed to the hospital after experiencing intense bleeding. Doctors told her that after giving birth to a stillborn baby in a previous operation, Howard had a strong possibility of developing cancer, and if she did not have her uterus removed, Howard got the surgery completed at UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles, and within three weeks, she was back to her normal routine. Howard died on March 28, 2020, 15 days after her 91st birthday in Gallatin, Tennessee. We were all so lucky so many nights to hear her voice on stage and to catch up with her backstage. We're all better for having had her in our lives, said Dan Rogers, vice president of the Grand Ole Opry. She's buried at Spring Hill Cemetery in Nashville.